here we are, Leviticus for Beginners is the class, Training for Holiness, subheading of our class. We're in lesson number two, and the uh, title for today's lesson is Holy People Then and Now. So in our introductory lesson, we reviewed the basic questions asked concerning any book of the Bible that we would choose to study. For example, things like uh, who wrote the Bible, uh, not the Bible, but who wrote the particular uh, book? When was it written? What is it about? Is there a theme? How is it divided? That's usually the first lesson in the study of any uh, Bible book. We also looked at the uh, Pentateuch or the Torah, which are the first five books of the Old Testament uh, written, we believe, by Moses and of which the book of Leviticus is the third book in that series. As the subtitle of this study on Leviticus suggests, we understand that the theme of the book is holiness and that this book, Moses spells out uh, in specific terms what God required of the people, the Israelites, in order to be considered the holy people of God. Of course, as he said, I am holy, therefore you shall be holy. Uh, well, what does it take to be holy? And the, the book of Leviticus answers that question. So in this lesson, we're going to compare the demands of holiness then in the Old Testament and the demands of holiness now in the New Testament and review some of the reasons why we should study the book of Leviticus and note the different ways that holiness, or rather different ways to holiness, that God has provided then and now. And so all of this preparatory material will really give us some background and some uh, stickiness, if you wish, so that the ideas presented uh, when we get to the text of uh, Leviticus will make some sense to us uh, immediately. We'll, we'll be able to put it in some sort of uh, context. All right, so holy people then and now. This idea of a holy people first appears in the book of Exodus when God offers the descendants of Abraham a new covenant. Up until that time, Exodus 19, five and six, when uh, Moses and uh, the Israelites arrived at Mount Sinai and they camped before the mountain, uh, this was about three months uh, after their departure from Egypt, during the time starting with Moses' call by God at the burning bush, through the 10 plagues and the people's freedom from Egyptian slavery, the crossing of the Red Sea and the destruction of the Egyptian army, all the way to the people receiving water and food miraculously uh, while they were in the wilderness, all during this time, God was in the process of fulfilling his first and original covenant made with Abraham and renewed through Isaac and uh, Jacob. And so that first covenant was the promise to give the descendants of Abraham the land of Canaan as their own land and also to multiply his descendants and from them would come one who would bless all the families of the earth. And we understand that to be the Messiah. We read about that in Genesis 12, one to three, and again in Genesis 17, one to eight. Now, the second part of that covenant was fulfilled when Jacob and his family took refuge in Egypt under the protect, uh, protection of his son, Joseph, who had become second to the Pharaoh during the great famine. And we know that story told in Genesis you know, Joseph sold into slavery uh, into Egypt and ultimately becoming second in command uh, to the uh, Pharaoh. And ultimately his brothers, you know, come uh, from the land of Canaan to, to get food. And they uh, ultimately learn uh, of his true identity. Uh, he invites the whole family, including his father, Jacob, to come and settle in the land of Goshen. Uh, where they will be uh, taken uh, care of, uh, and they begin to live there in uh, Goshen. And so from the original 70 people uh, who came with Jacob, over the next 400 years, the Israelites grew to a population of about 2 million people, 
at the time of the Exodus. Read about that in Numbers 11, verse 21. And so this fulfilled the second promise of the first covenant, where God said to Abraham, I will multiply you greatly. I'll give you the land, the land of Canaan, the promised land, and I'll multiply you greatly, all right? What we read about in the book of Exodus is God fulfilling the first promise to Abraham, which was that he would give them the land of Canaan or the promised land. Exodus describes the beginning of that journey that will eventually see the Israelites after 40 years of wilderness wanderings, finally enter and take possession of the promised land as described in the book of Joshua. Okay. So the first two promises of the covenant with Abraham, and I put in brackets, which uh, were ratified by circumcision. In other words, all those who were part of that promise were circumcised. And so the first two promises of that covenant ratified by circumcision, number one, receiving the land of Canaan as their own, and two, multiplying their numbers, that was being fulfilled. The third, part of the covenant that the families of the earth blessed would be fulfilled uh, 1500 years later as Jesus was born from a tiny remnant of the Jews still living and under Roman bondage on a small strip of land in Judea in Galilee, a small strip of land about 145 miles long and maybe 50 miles wide at its you know, widest. And so, you know, they started with two million people. They started, uh, they controlled all of the uh, land. But by the time Jesus arrived, they were, you know, they had been reduced in number. They uh, were living under the yoke of Roman uh, oppression. Uh, they had no real political or military power. They were reduced in size. Even the land that they had originally inherited had originally been given to them by God had shrunk, okay, where they, it was only a small piece of land that they had. Nevertheless, God had preserved that remnant in order to fulfill the third part of his promise. And that was to send the Messiah, the one who would bless uh, all, of the, uh, all of the nations. So while this covenant was being fulfilled, God established a second covenant with the Israelites, which was more demanding of the Jews, but offered greater physical and spiritual blessings. So let's read about that in uh, Exodus chapter 19, verses one and two. In the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day, they came into the wilderness of Sinai. When they set out from uh, Rephidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. And there Israel camped in front of the mountain. Moses went up to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain saying, thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the sons of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. And so the great difference between these two covenants was the issue of holiness which the people were now going to make as a central part of their relationship with God. Obedient faith being the substance of the first and an attempt or uh, you know, the, the exercise of uh, practicing holiness and maintaining holiness uh, was the central idea of the second. So God's holy people then and now, let's talk about this holiness idea. The actual meaning of the word holy, kadosh uh, in the Hebrew, means separate or set apart or sacred. It has a highly religious uh, 
uh, uh, connotation in that it was not a common word used in, in, everyday, in everyday language, everyday conversation, but it was put into use for religious purposes and was a word used from the earliest times in religious context. For example, the first time it was used was in Exodus uh, chapter three, uh, verse five, where God said to Moses from the burning bush that he was standing on holy ground. And from that point on, the term holiness uh, took on more and more significance. In one sense, the word describes an object or a place or a day which is to be considered holy, meaning the day will be devoted or dedicated to a particular purpose. Holiness, as I've said before, is the main theme of the book of Leviticus. The word holy appears 90 times and is used in 76 verses of the New American Standard Bible's version of the book of Leviticus. The following is a list of what and who are described as being holy in Leviticus. For example, the Lord God of Israel, his name and how he is treated uh, is holy. Uh, and uh, in prayers and praise, the people would say, holy, holy, holy are you uh, God in heaven. And so uh, the people associated holiness with God uh, in Leviticus 11, 44 and 45, uh, Leviticus chapter 20, as well as verse uh, chapter 10. Uh, also the people of God, they are holy. Not only God is holy, but the people of God are termed as holy in Leviticus 11, 44 and chapter 45. Uh, excuse me, verse 45 and chapter 19, verse two. The tabernacle and the complex and all the elements in the tabernacle is considered uh, as being holy. Uh, Leviticus 16, verse 12. The priests and even the garments that the priests wore, uh, these were holy. Leviticus 8, 9, 16, 4 and 21, verse six. The sacrifices that were offered uh, at the tabernacle, these also were considered as being holy, uh, Leviticus 14, 13. The feasts that they observed throughout the year were holy, Leviticus 23, verse two. And that uh, which was given or offered to God, whatever that was, was holy, uh, Leviticus 19 and also Leviticus uh, 27, verse nine. And so, both the priests and the people had to make the distinction between the holy and the profane. In other words, they had, to, they had to treat these things differently. Some things were holy and some were profane, meaning they were ordinary, they were common, uh, as, we, uh, as well as uh, things that were clean and unclean in the life and in the worship of God's people a holy nation of God and a big part of their uh, life and a big part of their practice uh, was to distinguish between what was clean and unclean, what was holy and what was uh, unholy. In practical terms, however, being a holy nation required the Israelites to be holy or separate in two particular ways. First, they needed to be separated from other nations. Being a holy nation meant they didn't mix with other nations. In other words, they didn't intermarry, they didn't interworship. They were separate from other, they kept themselves separate from other nations. That was one of the requirements for becoming holy. And also uh, they had to be separated for God's use. They weren't just separated for the sake of being separated, they were separated in order to be exclusively used by God for his purposes. So let's look at those two ideas separated from other nations. We uh, read in uh, Leviticus 11, 44 and five, it says, for I am the Lord your God, consecrate yourselves therefore and be holy for I am holy and you shall not make yourselves unclean with any of the swarming things that swarm on the earth 
for I am the Lord who brought you up from the land of Egypt to be your God. Thus, you shall be holy for I am holy. And so God did not free the Israelites from Egyptian bondage simply as an act of mercy for an oppressed people. You know, he didn't do it because he pitied them. Uh, delivering them to the promised land uh, so that they could live freely and plentifully as a free nation on their own land. Again, this was not a final end unto itself. This was not a final goal. It was a means to an end, but it wasn't the end itself. God had a, a higher spiritual purpose for the Israelites, and that was that they would become his people and thus a holy nation. And in order for that to happen, they needed to be freed from bondage and they needed to live uh, in their own land. Yes, they needed a place to live uh, and land to support their physical needs, but this was secondary uh, in service to their primary role uh, and associated tasks that came with being the people of God, a holy nation among all the nations uh, around them. So God freed them, yes, and God gave them the promised land yet, but there was, a, there was a, an, alter, an, alternative, an ulterior motive uh, for that. And that was so that he could train and teach them to be the holy people of God and worship him as the holy people of God. Uh, and that was much easier to do in their own land that they controlled uh, the land that gave them uh, sustenance and so on and uh, so forth. So we read uh, in uh, Leviticus uh, 18 verse 30, thus uh, you are to keep my charge that you do not practice any of the abominable customs which have been practiced before you so as not to defile yourselves with them. I am the Lord your God. So here he's talking about mingling with the other nations. You won't do that, he says. You won't copy the things that they uh, do. You won't defile yourself. You won't dirty yourselves. You won't you know, uh, become unholy by practicing the things that these other nations practice. That's why you need to keep yourself uh, separate from them. And then in uh, verse nine, it says, when you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you, you shall not learn to imitate the detestable things of those nations. The same idea, but much more specific. The things that the nations did will be actually described in the various prohibitions uh, that God gives them that they shouldn't do, that they shouldn't practice. It goes into detail. Here it's only mentioned you know, in a general sense. If you want to be my people, a holy people, uh, you won't associate and mingle with the nations around you and you will not copy their uh, practices. And so being God's people, a holy nation, required them to avoid the common practices of the unholy nations that came before them and surrounded them now. And as we will read, they had to begin to practice the lifestyle and worship of a holy nation that God through Moses would now give them. Being a holy nation required that the Israelites make no arrangements or compromise with the nations around them in order to secure peaceful relations. You know, they weren't to give in to various uh, worship practices and uh, to various uh, uh, practices or habits in order to keep the peace. Uh, God sent them into the promised land and the way to deal with the nations there was to wipe them out. Because if they compromised, this would invariably lead to intermarriage and eventually the introduction of pagan gods and worships and, and, and pagan practices. Compromise was Satan's most effective strategy in his effort to destroy God's people and ruin their holy status. It wasn't that they, you know, when you, when you read through this, you see it over and over again. It wasn't that they totally rejected God. It wasn't that they said, okay, we're, you know, we're done with God. It's too much work, this holy business. You know, we, we, don't, we just want a simple life, we want him. No, they didn't say that. 
No, the danger was that they would continue to worship God, continue to practice the things that he had given them through Moses, but at the same time, start bringing in practices and rituals and gods uh, you know, and, and various uh, uh, elements of worship that came from other uh, nations and other religions. And usually that happened through intermarriage. You know, a man would take a, a wife from the Canaanites and she would bring her gods and her father's gods and her sister's gods and so on and so forth. And so in doing so, uh, they would eventually fail the first test of holiness, which was to keep themselves separate from other nations and the worship of other gods. The other requirement of being God's holy nation or God's people is that they were separated for a purpose. You know, being separated from other nations, again, wasn't a goal in itself. It was a means to a goal. It was the means to, to keep themselves pure. Why? Because God had a use for them. God had a purpose for them uh, if they remained uh, his people. And so the first aspect of holiness is what you won't do or what you'll stop doing. And in their case, mixing with unholy pagan people and practicing pagan ways in worship. The second aspect of holiness is what you will do as a holy nation and people of God. And that is to follow and obey God's commands and his instructions for a holy living. God is the one who dictates what is holy. We're not the ones that say, oh, this is holy or that is holy. No, God, God is the one that does that. He is the one that says this is clean and this is not clean, not us. For example, there's nothing innately better than you know, uh, uh, destroying a sheep by burning it you know, with fire you know, as a sacrifice or killing a, a mule by slitting its throat. In both cases, what, what have you done? You've simply, you've, you've killed an animal, different types of animals. You've killed two different animals in two different ways. And so both are simply different ways of killing different animals, nothing better or worse in either of the ways. However, however, killing a sheep and then burning it by fire becomes a holy act of devotion to God when God himself gives instructions to do so in the process of worshiping him. Ah, now killing that sheep and offering it on the altar and so on and so forth uh, as a response to the instructions given to us by God. Now that becomes a holy thing. It eliminates all other things. In other words, it's not a donkey that he wants. It's not by slitting the donkey's throat. He didn't ask for that. You know, we do what God tells us, not what he doesn't tell us. All right. Same, some thing or action or person becomes holy only when God deems it or him or her as such. That's the essence of holiness. God separating or instructing a particular thing or action or person for his own purpose and use. That's what makes that thing, that action or that, that person holy. God is the one that sets it aside for that. In the case of the Israelites, they were expected to keep themselves separate and holy for God's purpose. There was nothing about them as a people that made them uh, innately or automatically holy. The fact that God chose them for a special purpose, this is what made them a holy people. This is what made them the holy nation of God. Now, as the holy people of God, the Israelites were to live their lives according to God's will and thus fulfill his ultimate purpose for them. First, to be a witness or a light of his existence to the pagan world that they lived in. God wanted all men to know who he was. He chose the Israelites, 
He separated them for the purpose of being his witness to other nations of his existence. Why was that necessary? Well, because all nations were involved in paganism, uh, in pagan worship, uh, which was diabolic. And so in order to clarify, in order to shine light on them, God chose a people to be his witness to the pagan nations. That was the first thing. And then secondly, to be the nation and the people through whom the Messiah would eventually make his appearance here uh, on the earth. They didn't know that. They knew that someday in the future through them, there would be a blessing. Uh, but uh, they didn't know much more than that. In a sense, the Israelites were to be the historical, cultural, social, and religious stage upon which the Son of God would make his appearance in the physical world. God was to send his Son to the world but who was he going to be? What, what nationality would he be? What language would he speak? What history would he have? What religion would he have? What social functions uh, would he do? Uh, what practices would he uh, uh, practice? Well, there was no nation with its practices that was worthy of that. So what did God do? He chose one man, Abraham, and through Abraham, he created a nation. And he gave that nation a religion and laws and social customs and so on and so forth. All right. And all of these things uh, would be a stage upon which Jesus was entered. Who is the Messiah going to be? Well, he was going to be a Jew. And as a Jew, as a devout Jew, as a holy Jew, he would follow God's commands and he would follow God's, you know, the feasts that God had given and he would practice the religion that God had given him to practice and so on and so forth. That was the other purpose uh, for which God had selected uh, the Jews. So the information in the Pentateuch teaches us uh, the source and development of the Israelites. In Genesis, for example, we learned about Abraham and, and, and Jacob and the 12 tribes and the manner in which they became God's chosen people and how they came to settle in the land of the Canaanites or what we call the, uh, the land of uh, promise. The book of Exodus uh, introduces us to uh, Moses in Egypt and, and the covenant and the book of the law given uh, and the people becoming God's uh, holy nation and the manner of life that they were to live and worship as the holy people of God. That story is told in Exodus. Uh, in Exodus and parts of uh, Leviticus, uh, the law is given and the tabernacle and the rules for uh, holy worship are given. Uh, all of these things are uh, given in detail uh, lots of detail, as I said in the, in the last uh, lesson, you know, a lot of, reason, a lot of reasons why uh, people kind of skip over Leviticus is because it becomes tedious. It's all about rules and regulations and so on and so forth, how the priests should dress and what they should do, what's clean, what's unclean, all that business. But that was very important as far as the Jews were, were concerned because it was, it was these things that made them distinct from other, uh, from other nations. Uh, we learn about the uh, wanderings in the wilderness, uh, the division of the promised land and the, the final instructions uh, for enter in, entering in uh, to the uh, promised land. Uh, we learn about that uh, from Numbers and Deuteronomy. Uh, we uh, get the tribal boundaries and the uh, Moses' final instructions and summary of instructions uh, that comes to us in the book of Deuteronomy. So our study in the book of Leviticus, therefore, demonstrates to what degree Israel was to be dedicated to the Lord. Leviticus will show us that according to its instructions, 
the Israelites were not only separated unto God by their worship practices and their observances, along with the adherence to festivals and food laws, but every facet of their lives. Uh, when I say every facet of their lives, I'm talking about marriage and work and social interactions and parenting. All of these things were to be governed by God and his instructions. And so being the holy people of God meant that God's will informed every aspect of their lives, not just their worship rituals and practices, but their daily lives as well. There was to be no separation between you know, their worship life and their, uh, their, their daily life. Everything was combined together as a whole and, and the whole uh, 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 was informed uh, by God's commands and God's directions and God's ordinances and God's teaching, all right? And so we get to a section, you know, uh, holy people then and, and, and now. Being God's people today, God's holy people today, we are the church, we're the kingdom, we're the saints, we're the saved. But being God's holy people, even though we use different terms, means the same thing as it did in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the word for holy, kadash, uh, meant separated from sin or consecrated to God and his purpose or sacred or the word we've been using, holy. In the New Testament, the word hagios in the Greek means uh, saint or holy or separated. And so like the Israelites, Christians are to be separated from the world, you know, uh, in the world, but not of the world, Jesus says, John chapter 15. And we're to be separated from the world for God's purpose and God's plans because the holy people of God today uh, are us. Uh, the church. And this means something. First of all, it means that Christians are separated from the world. This literally takes place when we are converted. In Colossians chapter one, Paul writes, for he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And so before, uh, we are alive physically and mentally, but we're dead spiritually since we're separated from God. You know, like we're, we're, we're branches in a tree and because of sin, uh, we're cut off from the tree, like a branch is cut off from a tree. And it looks alive for a while, you know, it'll have leaves on it, maybe fruit on it, and it looks exactly like the tree, you know, on the first day that it's cut away from the tree but eventually the branch will die, the leaves will shrivel and die and the fruit will rot and, and eventually it'll just blow away into dust uh, while the tree continues to grow. In the same way, when we're cut off from God because of sin, we're alive for a while. We build things, we walk around, we have children, you know, and so on and so forth. We create music and art, we do all of those things, but eventually, as the years go by, our bodies give way, we shrivel up and we die, right? However, we not only die physically, but because we're cut off from God, we die spiritually as well. So before we we're alive physically and mentally, but we're dead spiritually since we're separated from God. That's what uh, Paul says in Ephesians 2, he says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins which you were formerly walked, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. And so we became the holy people of God in Christ Jesus. You know, God said to Moses, tell the people, you know, I'm holy, therefore I want you to be holy. Well now, when we're converted, when we become Christians, we now have become the holy people of God. In 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, 9 and 10, it says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him 
who has called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. You see the two things there? You're called out, you're, you're, you're called out. You become a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God. You know, that's, that's, you've been called out, but you've, you've not just been called out for the sake of being called out. He goes on and says, he's called you out of the darkness into uh, the marvelous light, for you were once not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So we're those people. We're the called out. We're the holy ones of God today in this generation. We became the holy people of God in Christ Jesus as we came to, him, to God through faith in Christ expressed in repentance and baptism. So just as the Israelites were not to mix with the surrounding pagan nations for fear of falling into their sinful practices and into their idolatry, you know, the worshiping of, of other gods, Christians also come out of the world and its practices and its values and its vices and what this is now, you know, and this is now what the life of holiness means. We don't do that anymore. You know, in Romans uh, chapter 12, verse two uh, says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. In James, it says, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained uh, by the world. A couple of more scriptures. First John uh, 2.15 says, do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And then finally, 2 Corinthians 6, Paul writes, uh, do not be bound together with unbelievers for what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness or what fellowship has light with darkness or what harmony has Christ with Belial or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever. And so to summarize, to be holy therefore means that we are separate and we're distinct from the world in our speech, in our actions, in our values, in our priorities. People can't quite put their finger on what's different about us. But the difference in a word is holiness. We're God's holy people. We don't participate in the deeds of darkness. Like the Israelites, being God's holy people today also means uh, that we are separate from the world for, uh, God's, uh, for God's use. This means we're completely dedicated to Christ who leads us. Moses led the Israelites to the promised land. Christ leads us to heaven, the heavenly kingdom and the eternal life that we have promised to us with God. We are separate from the world to become disciples of Jesus uh, in Luke uh, chapter uh, 14, verse 33. He says, so then none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own uh, possessions. And so as, a, as disciples, we separate from the world by doing away with sin in our lives as an ongoing exercise as we cooperate with the Holy Spirit in this in endeavor. You know, what are my possessions? Well, you know, it's my hat and my coat and my house and my car and my keys and, you know, my bike and uh, my possessions, but, but, but Jesus is talking about more than these type of possessions, because he said somewhere else, the father knows what you need to live. He knows you need a coat. He knows you need a bike. He knows you need a car. He knows you need food. The possessions of self-will, the possessions of, I want to do things my way, the possession of pride, the possession uh, of, 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 of uh, envy and anger and arrogance. Those are the possessions we have to give up. Those are the things secretly we love to keep, we want to uh, maintain. Paul says in Romans chapter eight, he says, so then brethren, we're under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. That's what I was just talking about you know, envy and lust and pride and uh, we're going to do it my way, arrogance, you know, that's the flesh. 
That's, that's the stuff we give up. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the spirit you're putting to death, that's, that's giving up, you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the spirit of God, these are sons of God. And so as a human being, I work, I build a family, I enjoy the blessings that God has provided me in this world. You know, uh, a car, a food, a house, uh, you know, those type of things. Uh, but I do away with the things that he has forbidden, the things that uh, are irreconcilable with a holy lifestyle. Ask yourself when you're doing something, seeing something, absorbing something, consuming something, participating in something, ask yourself, is this holy, is this holy living? Is this a holy practice that I'm involved in? Can I present the, Can I take this and offer it to God as a holy offering? Just like the Jews, you know, that they bring their offerings to God and there were some things they could offer and some things they couldn't. Can we bring everything that we have, our possessions, you know, can we bring those things and, and lay them before God as an offering? As a Christian and a disciple, I cooperate with the Spirit of God in the transformation of my inner man to live a holy life, growing more obedient to God and more Christ-like until the final transformation when I am resurrected. As Paul describes in 1 Corinthians, behold, I tell you a mystery, we'll not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable and this mortal must put on immortality. I do this privately as I live out my life of faith and I do this publicly and corporately as I meet regularly with the saints for worship and for fellowship and for witness and for service. Just as God provided instructions for the Jews in how to become and maintain their holiness in the Old Testament period by providing the law and ordinances we find in the Torah, in the Pentateuch, Jesus provides the information to become and to maintain holiness and live as the holy people of God today through the gospel and through the writings of the New Testament. And so studying Leviticus, even though it contains laws and rituals that don't pertain to us today, studying Leviticus will help us to understand the essence and the practice of holiness a spiritual condition that all people of God seek to attain no matter what era, no matter what time in which they live. All right, well, that's our lesson for uh, today. Again, uh, first couple of lessons, a lot of information before we actually get into the text. I again encourage you to read uh, Leviticus uh, chapter one to seven, because that's, uh, we begin the, uh, study of the text in our next uh, lesson. And uh, I remind you, if you haven't already, I remind you to uh, obtain one of the workbooks. You can download the uh, PDF file from uh, uh, just from the website and have that for each lesson. Uh, but if you want the book already pre-printed with all the lessons in them, you'll just have to uh, order that and uh, uh, both, both of these things to be very useful for you uh, as you follow this lesson. So thank you very much for your attention. And if God is willing, uh, we'll see you for lesson number three very soon.